<laughs> All right, I am back in. We're going to try this thing again. We are going to try it again. Can y'all hear me now? Are y'all able to hear me? Are you able to hear me, see me? Yes, we're going to get this show on. Oh, there we go. Thank God. Look at God. All right, let me tell y'all something before I go ahead and get started. Number one, I appreciate and I thank y'all for being so patient through the technical difficulties. And everyone who is watching right now, if you are a student or if you are a parent, this is exactly what students are going to experience when they start school. No, we didn't set this up this way. Like we've been doing this for a while. We've been having shows virtually and this has never happened. But if you're watching, this is exactly the type of stuff that students are going to have to go through, that parents are going to have to go through when it comes to students learning. What do you do when you don't have internet connection? What do you do when, you know, the teacher gets cut off from, you know, teaching live and the students can't get back in? This is exactly what we're talking about. And these are some of the things that we're going to be discussing on tonight to help ease some of the frustration and some of the anxiety that students and parents are going to actually have on tonight. So with that being said, we're going to actually now have an opportunity to introduce our panelists on tonight. Once again, thank you all for being so patient with the technical difficulties. But we're going to get this show on the road because nothing is going to stop us from getting this information out on tonight. So we can bring our panelists in. I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So we'll first start off with Mr. Tim Ware. Tim Ware, join us. Hey, everybody. Happy to be here. Uh, James, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Again, uh, as he said, my name is Tim Ware. I've worked in the space of public education here in Memphis since 2006. And for seven years before that, worked in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, overseeing what we now refer to as wraparound services. Uh, for a hospital that serviced the community uh, that I lived in. Uh, so super excited to be here. Uh, really looking forward to digging into the conversation and looking to learn uh, from the perspectives of so many others on the panel. Thank you so much, Tim. Next up, we have the one and only Miss Janae Douglas. Janae, tell us about tell us about yourself. Hi, good evening. I'm excited to be here as well. I'm currently the managing director of program in Memphis Scholars Charter School here in Memphis. Um, I've been a a middle school teacher, a principal in elementary school, and in my current role, I oversee our academics and uh, manage our principals. And I'm just excited to share um, the insight that we, I've gained from us practicing this uh, so far in this summer PT and then learning what you all want to see and hope is true when we go on school. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next up, a part of our wonderful panelists tonight, we have Ms. Tara C. So as she is transitioning on in, oh, there we go. Come hey. on. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Tara C., the director for the Universal Parenting Place at Christ Community Health Services here in Memphis, Tennessee. I am also a licensed professional counselor, um, and I am a native Memphian. Uh, went to the high school and then uh, on to University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Then came on home to Lemoyne on College, the HBCU of Memphis, um, and then uh, to my master's at Walden University. And so my background, I uh, was a social worker for many years, working with people with um, intellectual disabilities with the state of Tennessee. I've worked with Hurricane Katrina survivors. Um, I have also worked with the Department of Children's Services. Um, and uh, with my therapy career, I began that at Youth Villages um, as a clinical supervisor of the in-home services department where um, we, I basically uh, had a team of therapists who went in the home to uh, keep at risk families together, their children in the home or return them to the home. Um, and so I have always worked with families or at-risk populations, um, as well as being a part of that uh, population myself, being a native Memphian um, raised in Westwood, Tennessee. Okay. All right. <laughs> so now I am currently the director of Universal Parenting Place, where we are a charging station. The w that's the way I like to think of it for parents to give them that 
added support because uh, for most parents listening, uh, unfortunately, Baptist East um, and Methodist Germantown do not give out a parenting manual that uh, is going to be effective for each year <laughs> of your child's life. And so um, we don't have that. So we are here to support parents through all of the challenges, um, especially through the one that we're talking about today through pandemics. Um, and so I have uh, become a fan of the collective and I am just so honored to be a part of this uh, great discussion because um, all the topics that I've seen so far have been very much needed. And I wish they were around um, as I was growing up, because I'm sure my mother in my village would have appreciated having some of this information kind of uh, already um, given to them. So I am very excited to hear what the other panelists have to say, as well as giving some information um, as well. All right. Thank you so much, Tara. And then last but not least, to join our panelists, to solidify our panelists, we have a student leader, Ms. Shamara Smith. Come on in, Shamara. Shamira, tell us about yourself. You're on mute. There you go. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hey. My name is Shamir. I'm a high school leader and I'm excited to tell my perspective on doing um, virtual learning. All right. OK, well, as I said before, you know, the technology glitches came. Like I said, we have a lot to share. It is not going to stop us from getting this message out on tonight. And it's so ironic that we were having glitches because, hey, this is going to be a part of the actual experience that students and teachers and also parents are going to deal with this upcoming school year. A lot of schools actually started virtual learning on Monday and several schools will actually begin virtual learning on August 31st. So our charge as a collective Memphis is to figure out how we're gonna reimagine education and what can we do to create a village for our students and our parents during this pandemic. So this is part one. We're gonna focus strictly tonight on our students and our parents. So what better way to kick off our panelists, uh, kick off our questions uh, then having a fun question, you know, of course, the teacher is coming out of me now. We got to have a fun question to break the ice on tonight. So my first question is going to go to this one is going to go to Mr. Tim Ware. So, Tim Ware, if you were uh, an animal, what animal would you be that represents your personality? So what animal out there represents your personality? I'm going to go with Bengal tiger. And why? You know, you got to explain why. Man, oh man, the the why the why might not make me look good, but their uh, their predatory skills are unmatched in the animal kingdom. Uh, so that uh, oh no, them yeah, but then their the colors are just beautiful, like the orange and the black and the white. I mean, to me, it's one of the most beautiful uh, creatures uh, out there. But then yeah, their I mean, predatory and hunting skills are pretty impressive. All right, so that's. Bring home the bacon, bring it home. All right, I love it, I love it. So our next icebreaker question is gonna go to Miss uh, Janae Douglas. So Miss Douglas, uh, what uh, has been the best piece of advice that you have ever received? Um, let's see, so I'll uh, share one in terms of teaching. So when I left our summer institute and got ready to come back to the region to teach, uh, my advisor said, beware of the lounge talk. Um, that was like the piece of advice she sent us off with. And I think that I, I tried to remember that uh, throughout my time of just you can't get caught up in negative conversation because it will undoubtedly bring you down and just, you know, find your group that is staying above the rest. And that's the people that you need to align yourself with. OK, thank you. That's true. Man, positivity is like ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So our next question is going to go to Shamira. So, Shamir, if you could be famous, what would it be for? Hmm. If you were famous, what would it be for? <laughs> Singing. Okay. Now, you know you got to give us a sample now. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. You know, we, I want to put you on the spot too bad tonight. But if you want to, you can now. Uh, I have to think about it. She said, I'll pass. But she said, not tonight. This is not America's Got Talent. <laughs> All right. And then our last icebreaker question is going to go to Ms. Tara C. So let's say we found a vaccine tonight, OK, and everything cleared up within the next month. Where would be your next vacation destination spot? Where would you go? OK. Um, 
this is probably going to sound weird, but I probably stay at home. <laughs> I let everybody else test out. I'm a thinker. So I'm the type of person I I have plenty of faith in Jesus in me. But um, with the pandemic, I have not seen my house as much as I've seen it uh, since I bought it 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it's become an amazing journey for me and uh, a new found uh, thing. There's always something to do. (laughs) <laughs> and I never get bored. So I'd probably let you all go out and test that good vaccine and we zoom and talk about it. And then I meet you all in probably about six months. <laughs> that part. She said, and then no. I go to Bora Bora. <laughs> Look, the she said, she, there we go. There we go. She said, Bora Bora. But she said, in the meantime, we're going to do this free 99 stay at the house. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So there are folks online who are ready to see what we have to say and what are some solutions and advice to give our students and our parents um, for virtual learning. So we're gonna get started with our student leader first, Ms. Shamira. So Shamira, first question is for you. And the question is, well, let me get some context. Uh, You've actually started school on Monday. And like I mentioned before, most students in Memphis and Shelby County will not start school until August the 31st. So since you've already started school, you got two days under your belt, okay? Uh, you know, I'm sure it's been an interesting two days. So for you, um, what are the positives and what are some challenges that come along with virtual learning? Okay, some positives is that I'm still able to get my education even though I'm not at school. And um, I'm still able to engage with my teachers just if I was still at school. Some challenges is dealing with distractions. Okay, sometimes, um, sometimes students will take their cell phone off me and sometimes you just have to deal with it because, you know, there there's always going to be that one person that's going to um, break the rules. So that's one of the challenges. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So um, you are still getting a quality education. So that's good to hear because a lot of parents have been very concerned about that. And then you said in terms of a challenge, just, you know, some kids kind of breaking the rule, testing the water, seeing what they can do. And, you know, for those teachers listening, hey, listen, because, you know, you're going to have it. It's just a part of the experience. That's not going to be all students, but, you know, that's going to be a part of it. Uh, To my other three panelists, before I go into specific questions for you all, I want to ask you, because there's been a lot of debate around what the school should and should not be doing, right? Uh, You had a lot of parents concerned with the role that the school should take, you know, based on just different homes and what um, parents have to deal with and wasn't necessary for them, right? So in your opinion, uh, and I'll start off with uh, Janae on this one, Ms. Douglas, in your opinion, what is the role of the school? What is the role of the school? And what should the school be held responsible and accountable for in the context of virtual learning? So everything is completely new. So what do you feel like is the role of the school and what should the school be responsible and accountable for? Yeah, so I think that the school, the role of the school has to be to provide an education for all students, to make that available to students. And really getting to understand what different students need. Can students log on at a specific time or do they need um, material to be recorded and provided to them in a way that they can do that on their own time? Um, And we can't let this year be a wash. This can't just be, we're gonna do a little bit now and set tide us over until this, you know, vaccine comes or it doesn't come. We have to stay focused on our goal, which is to educate students. In terms of accountability, I think we need to hold ourselves accountable to making sure the kids don't fall through the cracks. Um, <clears throat> you know, so much of what educators do happen happens in the hallways, between classes. Hey, let me catch you before you go, get on the bus to go home. And we're not going to have those organic opportunities anymore. So the school has got to create some safety nets to engage with kids, not about reading, but just life. How are you managing this? Do you need anything? And still providing those social work and counseling opportunities for kids to get the things that help them to do well with education. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Tim, you're up next. So in your opinion, what should the role of the school be and what should the schools be held responsible and accountable for? Yeah, so um, what what I'm about to share uh, may seem to go against uh, everything that I've lived and modeled for the last, you know, 15 years here in Memphis and what I've often articulated 
uh, and that's around accountability <clears throat> measures connected to outcomes uh, for schools. But right now, I actually think that the what the schools should be held accountable for is making sure that they deliver high quality instruction um, and that they are in a, a constant kind of learning orientation around how to do it in the context of virtual learning. I think that and that's very different from what we have historically done is say we measure the outcomes or we measure how much students have progressed as a result of the instruction that is being delivered. But I think right now in the specific context, it provides an artificial and unhealthy pressure on educators um, because we're, we're in this new unknown. And we are then saying that educators and school systems should be held accountable in a very different way than we are asking of any other system. So we're not asking that county commissioners or city councilmen or mayors mm -hmm. are accountable for uh, unemployment uh, or maintaining stable levels of employment in the community. We recognize that that is kind of outside of the scope of what they are, ability, they are able to control. And I think right now we need to recognize that as schools are learning and understanding how to deliver this type of high quality instruction in this particular context, but to start adding accountability measures um, connected to outcomes, I, I think would actually be um, detrimental to the teaching profession, detrimental to teachers, detrimental to the administrators and others that are working. The one, the one thing that I would add where I have, there's a big question mark because I recognize the challenge that exists in this space but I don't necessarily think that schools should have to solve this problem, but I, I need to name it because we all need to think about it. The number one reporter of child abuse and um, uh, the type of traumatic experiences that children uh, go through that require intervention, the number one reporting system for that is schools. Educators report that and then the intervention comes into place. In this context, our ability to see that and intervene in that space is, as educators is limited. And I definitely think that as a broader society, we need to figure that piece out. But historically, it has been a responsibility uh, that has been placed on schools almost by default. And I think we have to be really creative in how we, how we solve that X. Tim, you're going to make us have a part four. Don't play. <laughs> like, seriously, I mean, you just talked about all of the things that the schools, you know, are just, well, unfortunately, you know, in my opinion, have become responsible for, but it's yeah. not within their scope. Like, we schools only have so many resources and they only have, you know, so many things that they can do. But as you alluded to, that burden has been put on them. And in terms of like just even students and their welfare, I think that's a great segue for, for Tara, you know, in your in your position, in your role with mental health and wellness, what do you feel like is the role of the school and what should they be held responsible and accountable for from what you've seen? So from what I have seen, I truly feel that schools and as well as other organizations in the community should take this time to uh, become very trauma informed and trauma sensitive um, as a whole. And so what does that mean to be trauma informed? So trauma informed is a, a practice or a way of organizing organizing your system so that it's not I know we're focusing on the, the, the families and the children, but in order to truly serve the children, you have to make sure you take care of everything that surrounds the children in this educational system. So that's not only the children, that's the teachers, that's the support staff, that's the administration, that's the janitorial staff, that's the coaches, uh, the people who keep the grounds. And so everybody who is trained or trauma informed, uh, they have a different perspective and lens so that uh, not only are the kids mental health uh, uh, needs uh, taking advantage of, but the people who are providing the services, they need to ensure that they are where they need to be. Um, there are a lot of times where, yes, we do see a lot of unruly children or behaviors um, in the in the school, but a lot of times the reaction to that behavior, um, to me as a therapist and a clinician, I see that there is a different type of communication going on, whereas the teacher who is overwhelmed, uh, stressed out herself, uh, overworked, underpaid, uh, but very passionate, burned out, mm -hmm. um, she has needs as well. And so in the moment, 
she's not able to give that child what he or she needs or understand that this child is just communicating in a language that is probably not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if she had a trauma informed lens, she would be uh, slow to anger. Uh, thinking more and thinking outside the box. And so I think in terms of the anxiety that we see because of the pandemic, uh, the anxiety of the issues that were already there, um, being uh, coming from a trauma-informed approach, I think if the school takes on the responsibility of making sure that right now is the perfect time to actually have a lot of resources at your you know, fingertips. Um, mm -hmm. uh, not being in brick and mortar means you can instantly get a child connected to mental health resources that are doing telehealth, um, especially if they're jumping in and out of class. Hey, let's eliminate that attention and let's put that attention somewhere else. Um, that also means that the teacher gets the support that they need to think outside of the box or they have the space to know that, hey, if I'm not OK, there is a safe space or something or system that can uh, kind of take over or tap in or a, a place where I can go um, so that, you know, I can get what I need. And so when you take care of everybody in that building from a trauma informed approach that everybody is taken care of, um, then I think you will see a lot of uh, a, a lot better results um, in the school system. And you have children who are more responsive to instruction and criticism and feedback when they know that there are people who are truly understanding of their needs and willing to meet them where they are and help solve the problem and help normalize it versus just making them the problem and the target. I know Perfect. it's a lot, but <laughs> I, uh, my opinion. And I, and all of that was wonderful, right? Because if you continue to ignore the students, it's not going to go away. It's going to get mm -hmm. bigger and bigger, right? And a lot of times, as you alluded to, some of those behaviors that happen in the classroom, they're not being acknowledged. They're not being validated. So they're going to get their needs met. <laughs> it's either going to be through positive reinforcement or it's going to be through negative reinforcement. So if students are usually getting that acknowledgement and the energy that they get in a negative way, they're going to continue that. So they don't have those therapy sessions or counselors who, you know, who have the time to meet with them, right? Because counselors nowadays are so overburdened with paperwork, they can't even counsel. It's like counsel, the counseling role has become something completely different, right? They get to do everything but counsel. But that's another conversation. We're going to get to that. Right, like, right. You know, we're going to continue to go a little bit deeper in that. But I do want to bring it back. So let's bring it back to the parents now, right? Um, and this question is going to be for Janae. So I know when the announcement was made to actually have virtual learning, you know, I know the superintendent for Shepherd County School, Dr. Ray, you know, he had several surveys where parents had an option to either go to school virtually, go to school in person. But, you know, he made it clear and so did a lot of other charter networks within the district said that if cases continue to rise, that they were going to do what was in the best interest of kids, which is to, number one, make sure that they were learning in a safe environment. So since virtual learning is the reality for everyone in this district, in terms of public schools, um, what can parents do to create a village during this time, right? You had a lot of parents who were like, look, me and my husband, you know, uh, we can't do this. We got children. It is, it's not conducive to our working schedule. You have a lot of single mothers out there who are like, I don't have support. I'm doing this by myself. What can parents do between now and August 31st if they have not started school to build a village of support as they get ready to make this crucial transition to virtual learning? So I would advise starting with really getting to know what the structure is going to look like at your school. So there are a lot of different options, a lot of different models out there. If you're in a traditional public school or in an SES charter school, so contact the leaders at your school to know what learning is going to look like. Do kids need to log in at a specific time? Do they have a day, a week to complete their work? Um, once you have the context for what that day is going to look like, then I would start to list out what are the things that I know that my, my current village can supply. So can I be at home from eight to two? Um, do I need someone to cover that afternoon shift? And then as you start to examine the context, think about the what you already bring and can um, provide for your student, then start to say who can fill in these gaps. So, um, you know, Memphis is a very community uh, centered place. So are there people that live in your neighborhood that also attend the same school or who have a similar schedule? And you could kind of pair with those partners, with those parents, excuse me, um, or community members to maybe watch the kids for a few hours and provide a safe space for them to learn. 
That's excellent. So you said it right, parents, partners, yeah. because that's what we're all going to have to be, right? And I was talking to a friend and, you know, they weren't very familiar with their neighbors and now they are, right? And I hate to say this, but I posted this on Facebook like a couple of weeks ago and I was like, look, we're either going to evolve or we're going to dissolve. And what I meant by that is sometimes that, you know, uh, in human nature and just as people, we're forced to do things to to evolve and to, to get with the time, right? So this is actually, you know, going back to a never side ever problem lies an opportunity. This is a great opportunity, as Janae said, to forge those relationships, to meet your neighbors, to talk with them. Sometimes, you know, some folks have never even talked to their neighbors and had a conversation, but this is making us do things that I think is gonna benefit us in the long run once the pandemic is over. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna go to uh, Shamira, so for those of you who are, who are just joining in, Shamir is a, is a high school student leader and she actually started virtual learning on Monday. So my next question for you is, Shamir, for students who are gonna start virtual learning very soon, what advice would you give them to help them prepare for virtual learning? So in terms of checking emails and technology, any advice that you can think of since you've started? I know you only had two days, but what advice would you give them based on your experience so far that can set them up for success? Okay, some advice that I will give students is get prepared for distractions too, such as lagging. I have experienced a lot of lagging and it is kind of stressful and annoying to deal with, but it's part of it. Um, make sure like the day before your next class, you check your email just so you won't have to miss anything. That's very, very important. You don't want to wait to the last minute and get to your class and get late because attendance is real. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, so far, no, that's class, keep it coming. Keep it coming. Class assignments, make sure that you're paying attention, make sure that you're completing everything and double check and see, have you, um, turned in your assignments? That's very important because that's how you're getting your grades. So that's the best advice I can give. Now, I want to I want you to elaborate on one thing. I know you said something about attendance and it was very important. Um, how does that look for you at your school for virtual learning? Like, because I know you probably have some kids like I'm going to log in when I get ready. Right. They can't. I'm not physically there. So how can I be absent? How can I be tardy? What is what does that look like for the school that you attend? Well, it's still is if we were still in school. I don't know why students wondered it, if they can come late, they're still attending, not knowing it's the teachers can see what students are in there. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. So we'll continue to elaborate on that student perspective because it's a very important one. Um so my next question is gonna go to Mr. Tim Ware. So Tim, um, as we all know, there are a lot of you know virtual do's and don'ts um, that we are aware of and that we're not aware of, right? And sometimes we don't know what we don't know until we get into it. This is uh, gonna be completely new for a lot of parents. So uh, you've been the executive director of New Leaders, you've been a teacher, you've been a principal. So for, from your perspective and from your experiences, what are some virtual do's and what are some virtual don'ts? Um, this could be for students or parents as they're you know getting ready to embark on this journey yeah so i think you know one one of the things kind of most basic is what uh shamira shared earlier and that's just you know be mindful of muting your microphones you know even for us as professionals in the earliest days of this so let's go back to you know march april ish moving into may um my daughter five years old was at home um, getting her, you know, doing her schoolwork and other things. And there were a number of times, even as a professional where I'm here working and I forget my microphone isn't on mute. And, you know, sure enough, someone says, hey, we hear a beautiful voice in the background, but someone needs to mute the microphone. And so, you know, it's a pretty basic thing, but it does, as Shamira pointed out, it does help reduce um, distractions. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I would say, um, it, so this is a big do for me, and it's just give yourself grace. Give yourself grace. Give the presenters grace. Give the technology grace. Um, so I, I'm thinking about in, in our own experience again, you know, fortunately, we have been blessed to have, you know, two people in the home, uh, both with, um, you know, decent income. So we have a nice computer, strong Wi-Fi and all that. And we still experience multiple times when the computers were running or the servers were running slow, whatever happened, the, there were glitches in the instruction that was being delivered. 
So that was something we had to give grace to. And then, you know, in return, my daughter would get frustrated. Imani would get frustrated and, you know, want to walk away or fuss. So, you know, we needed to give grace to her as well. So the biggest do for me is actually give grace to all involved. We are all learning this. And that's from the technological aspect. That's from the actual presentation of instruction um, and, and how we learn and understand stand things to make that instruction better and better over time and then as instructors as educators recognize that you know the limits that many of our families are dealing with um it, you know three or four kids in one house that all have to get on computers together maybe there's only one or two bedrooms so it is a very distracting environment um you know wi-fi runs slow when you have four things streaming at one time um so th those are just some of the things um, that I would I would name always be in learning environment. Give grace to each other, and the, on the tactical end, just you know remember to mute your microphone. <laughs> and I love how you and Shamir, you guys tag and you know piggybacked off of each other, just because there are some things that are in our control, right? You know we can get prepared, make sure our laptops are charged when I'm you know on you know line, make sure that my mic is muted, my you know camera is showing. Um, but this also uh, ties into our next question that I'm going to have Miss uh, Miss Tara see. She's going to come in and jump on this question. So this one was a little controversial when the uh, school district came out with guidelines for what virtual learning should look like. So this question is going to go for you because I know that you can handle it. Um, and the question is, does it matter whether or not students are dressed in pajamas, bonnets, do-rags, uh, any type of attire that is not, uh, you know, in a uniform or regular clothing. Um, and then my follow up with that is, do you believe psychologically that students who are in sleepwear are even, you know, on the computer in their bed psychologically? Does that set them up for success in terms of them being able to be focused for the learning? So does it matter what students have on bunnies, do rags, et cetera? And psychologically, does being in sleepwear or even being in the bed during class virtually, does that play a role in students being able to be focused and um, on task during class? So let me just say this, as much as I like to be cute, I can't go to the gym in high heels and makeup, right? So every place has an appropriate of attire. And so I would say absolutely so, how you look is directly related to how you will feel. Um, we have the cliche, fake it till you make it. But what people don't realize is that fake it till you make it is a, an actual neurological process that happens in the brain. When you, when you constantly do something out of a habit, whether you want to or not, your brain catches a hold to it and it says, hey, this is what we're supposed to do. And so when we talk about traumatic experiences, you know, even when there is no threat, the brain alerts the body, hey, you know, get on defense, start yelling, start walking away, run out of the classroom. Um, and so I would say um, it definitely does matter uh, with how the children show up to school, because if they are dressed apart and when they brush them, their teeth, wash their face and get ready to go into the next room or to the other corner of their room, they feel a whole lot better than they did just merely waking up. They truly now, do. They what would you say to those parents who say, you know, y'all should just be happy as they logging on? You know, so what would you I would say to the parents part of the issue, and I, I don't want to step on toes, but I am, and I'm okay with that. Okay, look, I would say um, this is part of the issue that the teachers are experiencing. Um, if you feel that your child does not have to give their best, um, then do not be upset when those chores are not done. It goes both ways. Um, and so you have to set the foundation and be consistent. You can't be consistent and want children to follow your instructions, and then you don't want them to follow the district's instructions. And then you don't, you can't say anything when they're adults who are not consistent and don't want to follow adult uh, instructions, um, and you feel as if they should know better. So again, we are trying to pave the path in the brain uh, of excellence. And a child who is not able to focus will focus much more, uh, better. Uh, when they are dressed apart and they are clean, when they are refreshed, that water is necessary. Uh, all of those things uh, will definitely play into um, their success at school. If they come up in bonnets, 
guess what? They're going to probably be very sleepy and tired because our brain is designed when you get in the bed or when you put on a bonnet, it's night night time. Your brain already knows that. So <laughs> there's a science behind it. So parents, yes, please make sure that your children are clean. They are refreshed um, and do everything that you would normally do walking out the door but escort them right to their little corner or their little learning space and you will have uh, success. And that will definitely help you with the other areas of your life as well outside of the virtual learning. So this is the message that I'm going to give on today. Help yourself <laughs> by helping these teachers and helping your child. All right. All right. And I love it. You know, and, and, and the beautiful thing about having different people uh, on when you're t having conversations like these is that we get to hear all sides of the, the spectrum when it comes to just what we feel like is best for our kids. Right. And we know the ultimate responsibility is going to fall um, in the hands of our parents and also our students. And Tim, did you want, did you want to add to that? Jump in there. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say um, I certainly agree with what uh, Tara shared, and also wanted to add just some you know context that we see on Facebook. So it it a lot of the complaint and pushback with the way that people are framing the issue is that students shouldn't have to wear school uniforms if they're sitting in their house, and I think the one thing that I would add to what Tara said is that um like there there is an in between there you can get up as you know see she said you know you can get up do your hygiene and then put on a polo shirt or put on a clean t-shirt and sit in front of a computer like the the real the the only uh options are not either pajamas or a brand new school uniform we are simply we i think we should simply say that in this context and in this space we would love um, for uh, our young people, our students to, uh, as Tara said, you know, play the role, dress the part, like you are coming into a professional learning environment. We're not saying you need to have on a brand new uniform every day, but we are saying put on clothes that suggest that this is a professional learning environment. And I like how you made the distinction between, no, we're not asking students to wear uniforms every day. We're not asking them to go out to the mall and buy brand new clothes and wear that. No, we're just asking them just to wear some clothes, you know, be covered up, you know, be presentable. And I feel like uh, Tara alluded to this um, when she said, uh, it, it's around expectations. So why would we lower our standards for our students of color or our students who are, you know, maybe in, you know, low socioeconomic backgrounds and not have, you know, hold any standards to what to what they should be um, expected to hold? Because when they go out into society, no one is going to, you know, hold their hand and we got to get them ready within all walks and realms of life. Um, so I feel like you guys hit every, you know, side of that that you could because, um, we got to hold our kids not only to expectations, right, but like in a way that's loving, that's getting them prepared for the world that's out there. Because when you go on, when you go to a job or a job interview, there are certain things that you have to do. And what we don't want to do is set our students up for failure by not saying what they need to know now. And then they get out there. They're like, well, they let me do this when I was in school. I, I mean, anything can go when I was in school. And then they become an adult and graduate. And it's like a cultural shock. Right. You know, we don't want to do that. So that Can was, I add something? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what when you were talking, uh, I think what parents, a way to help parents to understand the reasoning behind that in all seriousness is that um, a lot of parents complain about how their children are sitting around the house bored. Um, they uh, are not uh, doing anything. Um, they're not meeting any of the expectations. And so I think the parents are missing the fact that uh, we are, even though it's the same environment, you have to create for that child a difference. You have to uh, get them in the mindset that, hey, um, this is what we have to do and this is the difference. Um, and so I had a coworker even suggest uh, get that one white polo or whatever the uniform is, put it on at eight and at three o'clock, put it right back on the uh, uh, hanger and hang it up. Mom, you don't have to wash a thing if you don't want to and say, you better not eat lunch in that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, think outside of the box. And, you know, honestly, again, these expectations help the parent to 
bringing that structure and that order to a situation that honestly they had no way otherwise of putting any some type of structure and routine in their in their space so i think for parents um they would have a lot less complaints of their children overall if they allow their children to be flexible enough to go with ideas that are silly if they feel like the uniform is a silly idea you know it is not going to hurt it's not going to hurt your children to be flexible enough to know that hey i don't agree with it either but you know what this is what we have to do and to teach them how to continue to be and do uh despite the challenge of what they honestly feel you know it may be unfair but work around that and and kind of think of some positives so that would be a positive um and because i don't think parents are looking at the long-term uh problem that may be uh that may run into uh your child possibly getting bullied because they don't show up with a shirt uh, like other people, or, you know, they have to wear the same shirt. And so th that can be a distraction. Right. Um, so I think everybody being the same will eliminate some of the barriers that, um, because there, as you are aware, there are challenges already that people have not, or teachers have not foreseen that are going on in the chat rooms and virtual learning experience that, you know, nobody thought would be an issue, but that would just be one issue, you know, um, to the to the problem right right and that's great and i'm glad that you alluded to that because we're going to definitely hit on that on part two which is for our teachers um and just being you know admin there's been so many different things i can't wait to get a part two because there's a lot to share on that um so my next question is going to go to janae douglas so um we, we've been talking about parents and parents who are watching and listening um, whether you realize it or not, you guys literally are going to be the glue that holds all of this together. Mm -hmm. The teachers can teach live all they want to. The students can log in on the computer. They don't have to log in. Of course, they will be logging in. But the parents, you guys are very instrumental in holding all of this together. And Janae, my question for you is, what are some, uh, what are some strategies that parents can use to stay on top of their child's assignment and progress, right? Um, you may have some parents who have to go to work, so they may not be able to stay home and watch Johnny log in on time, as Shamira talked about, being late for class or not showing up to a class at all. So what can parents do to uh, stay on top of everything, make sure that their kids are logging in and that they're on task and ready to go um, on day one of virtual learning, if they haven't already started? Yeah, so I think um, creating as many, so for one, I think creating a space, Tara mentioned that briefly, where kids can go to for virtual learning. So it's not okay to just kind of roll over, do what you need to do, like pop back in bed and then bring your computer with you. Designate a space in the, in the home where the child can like say, okay, this is school and that is different from when I'm on the couch and at home. Um, secondly, I would create some type of visual schedule for the students um, where they can, you know, maybe you could put on the wall above where their workspace is, like, this is what you do at this time, this is what you do at that time. Things like having lunch prepared for the kid at home, they can just go and grab, creating as much normalcy for this child as possible, I think is key. Um, and then also just really connecting with the leaders, the teachers to figure out how our assignment is gonna be posted. So at my network, we're using Google Classrooms but schools are using a variety of things. So how can the parent get in there and kind of help to um, manage and, and look out a few weeks to see what's coming next and help that student stay organized? I think organization um, is going to- And I loved how you talked about, that's key like structure, right? Um, having a place in the home, right? You know, if you have a table, if you have a desk, setting it up like it's an actual classroom because going back to, to the psychology of things, right? Mm -hmm. If you're calibrating your mind to be able to act as if you're in that classroom, which is why I'm also a strong proponent of teachers going to the school if if that's an option for them if, or if their health is able to provide that condition, right? The more that students can see normalcy within all of this, the better it's going to be for them to make this huge adjustment. So all of those strategies, like those routines, procedures, having the lunch ready. We are talking about this earlier, and I'm going to get to her again with um, checking your emails. What can I do to get with the school leaders to see, are y'all sending out newsletters and reports of, how the progress is going for the entire school. What can they do? So those were some great, uh, those were some great strategies. And speaking of strategies, I'm gonna uh, take it back to Shamira as from the student perspective, right? Cause she started school on Monday, virtual learning. And, you know, she definitely has an upper, an, a leg up than some of her peers who have not started yet. So my question for you, Shamira, is this, um, 
what can teachers do to make lessons interesting uh, for all students and what can they do to reach all students? Because as you know, some students just learn best physically in person. This is probably going to be a huge uh, challenge for those students who need that one-on-one. -on -one. So once again, Shamir, your question is, what should teachers continue to do to reach all students virtually? And then from your experience so far, what should they stop doing? What's not working? Okay, I believe um, teachers should continue to do office hours. Office hours is just like tutoring throughout the weeks and something that the teachers can stop is um, putting lessons up the day of the extra les lesson. I believe that it, it'll be better if they would have did the lesson 24 hours before the day instead of just sending it five minutes before the extra lesson start. So that's what I think. Now, the lessons that you're talking about, are those like in classroom assignments or is it like uh, work that is due uh, for the next day? So those assignments that have been posted, are those assignments that you guys have to do during that particular class? Well, um, Zoom links, something we do is Zoom. Okay. Sending links before class on the same day, I think it's kind of, I don't know how to explain it, but kind of annoying. I believe if they would have sent it the day before, only thing we'll have to do is just get out the class that we're in right now and then go ahead and just get the link instead of just waiting for a link. Okay, so that's good. No, that's great. So if you're a teacher, I hope y'all are listening. So she's saying, number one, if you're a student, the night before, we're not saying burn the midnight oil and be on your computer all night, you know, square, you know, going through your lessons and uh, checking everything at every moment in time, but like check the links, make sure that they're there. And for the teachers that are listening, and we'll get more into this in two weeks, you know, try to post what you can um, as, as early as possible, right? So for a student who's trying to log into a class, that would be stressful if you're trying to log into the class and the link is not posted and you're trying to work out the kinks and, you know, class starts in five minutes and it's not available. So, okay, so those are some pretty good uh, pieces of advice for some students and uh, teachers as well. And we'll get more into them next in a couple of weeks. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have a couple more questions and then we're going to go ahead and get ready to wrap up. Um, lots of great discussion and you guys are like hitting everything just spot on with everything. So let's continue that. Um, my next question is for Tim. Parents have more choice now than they ever have before. And I think there's a lot of confusion around virtual learning versus homeschool. You know, I've been seeing on social media and, you know, even the newspaper, you know, um, and even, you know, talking to different parents, like, look, I cannot homeschool my child. I got to go to work. You know, I can't do this. What's the difference between homeschool and virtual learning? And then what are the pros and cons for each one? Yeah, man. Uh, James, I could give you a four hour answer. Uh, <laughs> that question uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll seriously I'll, I'll keep it simple so um, the difference between virtual learning and homeschooling is that in virtual learning you have a certified teacher creating providing and delivering instruction to young people like that's what virtual learning is that you, you have a professional who is doing this for you versus homeschooling in its purest form would be you know the parent of a child who is learning the content themselves, creating the lessons themselves, delivering the content, you know, teaching the child themselves, evaluating whether or not the kid learned themselves, and then, you know, moving on with additional instruction. So yeah, homeschooling and virtual education or virtual learning is not the same. It's funny because even amongst my group of friends, I have to continually correct them when they say, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm just homeschooling my child. I'm like, no, absolutely, you are not. <laughs> there, there's a professional preparing instruction for your lovely son right now. Um, so I think I think that's the big difference. Pros and cons, I mean, that's a lot more difficult for me to answer in this context because I think um, people's preferences and perspectives and their beliefs weigh in heavily on that. But I, I, would, I would rather answer the question by saying that Right now, what is happening is in Shelby County that students are learning in a home environment. What is happening is that so many teachers and educators are trying their best, burning the midnight oil, as you said early, trying to figure out how do we create engaging, captivating learning experiences for our young people who are not physically in a space with us. 
uh, and my hats continue to go off to them. And if, if we really continue to keep a learning orientation through this period, you know, like I have no doubt that on the other side of this and the other side of, of this virtual instruction question could take several years. I mean, this is a massive shift in how we have done everything that we have done in terms of education. But I do think on the other side of it, teachers in Shelby County, teachers in Memphis, and teachers in America absolutely have the capacity to, to learn how to deliver great instruction in, in whatever the new normal is going to be. All right, I love that, yeah, because um, it's a lot. And I think there's a lot of uh, confusion and a lot of uh, misconception around virtual learning versus homeschool. So no, you are not going to be teaching your own child. That's homeschool. You gotta go through the Board of Education, the state, create the curriculum, do it yourself. So parents, that is not what this is. So you're gonna have a teacher who will be giving live instruction, as Tim said, every single day, quality instruction. It's gonna look different and it's gonna take some time to adjust. And that word grace is definitely gonna be key. But um, that is the big difference. I'm glad that you were able to expound upon that. So uh, Tara, so we have our last question and then we're gonna get ready to wrap up and have some final thoughts on tonight. So um, I know for the school that I work for, we actually started school on Monday and I did have an opportunity to check in with several students and just to get a temperature check. How are you? How are you feeling? And most of the students said, oh, look, oh, you said, where are you? Okay. I, no, how are you? Are you okay too? You, you didn't even have your hand. You had a long oh, day. You know, but seriously, so like, um, I asked the students, I said, look, how are you? What's going on? And they were like, look, Mr. Johnson, we stressed out. Um, we've been depressed. Um, we have a lot of anxiety. Um, some students, you know, they didn't give names or anything like that, but they were like, you know, I know some folks are going through some things in their own home and, you know, different homes look different. You had some students who said that they just missed being around their friends. They missed having that social interaction. Um, they missed being able to just wake up in the morning and get dressed and go to school. And one kid said, I never thought that I would say that, but they were like, I miss going to school. Um, they also said, I miss, I hate having to wear a mask. I wrote some things down everywhere you go, having to socially distance, um, just several things. I mean, the list can go on. I can go on for on and on. But my question for you as the mental health expert on this panel is what can students do to address their anxiety and mental health? And not just students, but even parents, right? This is stressful for them. So what are some things that both the students and parents can do to address anxiety and this stress that has permeated, you know, every household probably in this entire city? I would definitely say self-care um, and acknowledging and being aware of what you need uh, and how you can keep yourself safe is, is first and foremost. Um, I think our children and uh, this upcoming generation, and I guess the millennial generation is very good at thinking outside the box and being creative. Um, and so I would uh, task them to just be creative. Um, I know it's only so much zooming that you can do, um, but um, thinking outside the box means, you know, maybe meeting at the park and doing, you know, creating a game that's contactless, um, if that is such a thing. Um, I know a group of moms who just wanted to get together, uh, they took their cars and went to a lot back in backwards and got in their trunks. And that way the kids could, and they gave them rules, you know, we can't go and hug and touch, but this is a way of, you know, uh, having some type of social interaction with the mommy group. And so they would toss something in the middle and whoever got to it first, you know, would get it. And, you know, um, that was a game, but it was contactless. And so, you know, you have to just think outside of the box. Um, and I, I would task them with that. And so the more you task them with using their prefrontal cortex, which is the brain, the part of the brain right behind their forehead, um, you are, um, tapping into the things that they will need uh, for survival skills, how to make uh, decisions, the best decisions, um, while also taking care of themselves. Um, and you also um, help them to understand the importance of not just doing as you tell them to do for their safety, but you get them to think about uh, what, you know, uh, what would it take for them to be safe. And emotionally, um, I think, where a lot of parents um, could use the advice is 
allow your children to feel what they feel, listen to them, um, and then put it on them to figure out, so we have all these restrictions, what can you control? And so when you give a child, when you put things in the ball up or the area of the child to make a decision or to come up with or think about some things, you'll be surprised what that child will come up with that will basically uh, address all the safety concerns and also give them what they need. And that's a, that's a term that we call in counseling, collaborative problem solving. And so it looks like the parent is collaborating with the child, but no, you already put out your concerns. You're just tasking with them because we know that they can do it to come up with something that will keep them safe, but they also get what they need. And so everybody is happy. And so um, I will task parents, teachers, um, and anybody who deals with the kids um, who have anxiety, okay, what is it that you need? What are you feeling? Uh, for that child who, I think I heard somebody say, who does not do well, um, not in person, they may need to tap into their resources, talk to the teacher and say, hey, is there a way for me to have my own private Zoom listen? Or mm -hmm. can you allow me to, can you record it just so that I can look at it later on and, you know, really process it? Um, they have to open up their mouths and figure out what is it that you need? And I think um, a lot of the technology and, and other things being put in place takes away the kid's choice of um, thinking that they they there is a, there is another way of doing some things um, because it's already there. Um, right. But if they think they can you know, definitely think of some more creative solutions and uh, communicate in the more effective way versus just thinking that other people don't understand because they don't understand. They need you to tell them, so. Right, all right, and you, whoo. So I hope that if you were listening, parent or student, that was a lot. So I hope that you had a pen, I hope that you had some paper, and I hope that you were able to write all of those things down because as she said, closed mouths don't get fed. Right. <laughs> you know? um, folks in my family say that all the time. You hungry, you ready to speak up? Because once mm -hmm. I close the refrigerator, that's gonna be it. So in the context of virtual learning, we can't give you what you need. Parents, students, we cannot give you what you need unless you tell us, you know, there were some classrooms that I was going into today where uh, the teacher was asking a question. It was number crickets, cricket, 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 right? And then I had several kids emailing and calling me afterwards. Well, I don't understand this. I don't understand. I'm like, she asked you, how you feel? She, you know, she put you off mute. You know, you could have wrote in the chat. They said nothing, right? So, of course, probably just being nervous. School just starting. They don't want to say the wrong thing. Y'all know how kids are. They don't want to look. You know, I'm like, look, you know, this is a judgment-free thing because your teacher is just as nervous as you are, number one, but you don't know. And then number two, going back to what Tim said, this is about grace and how do we extend that? So, um, with that being said, as we get ready to wrap up, I did want to open up uh, the audience to ask a few questions um, of you all. Um, I do, you know, we do have quite a few people on here. So if you do have a question, put it in the comment section. Um, and our first, well, we have a statement. Kathy said, hey, uh, hey, Tyra, addressing the part is so important. It is how adults address students who are not in uniform in the virtual learning. Just is, is that just as important? And that's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Is how adults address students who are not in uniform in the virtual learning just as important. And you can go ahead and answer that one. Hey, Kathy. Kathy is one of my psychologist's uh, co former co-workers. We were at YV together. Um, but yes, um, I would say with the trauma-informed approach, approach that I spoke of earlier, um, there is a reason why children do what they do, whether it's appropriate or not. And so as an adult who's regulated, if you have a degree, you went to school and you have been employed, I say that you have the responsibility of being more appropriate. So I would definitely say, look at that situation from a trauma-informed lens and say, there's a reason why this child is out of uniform. Let me pull them to the side. Um, now is not the time to uh, embarrass them because I'm pretty sure they did not show up on virtual learning uh, in the, the wrong attire. Um, by accident. And so that's a, a bigger concern. And so um, I think addressing that, uh, maybe having a system where um, if the administrator can kind of, you know, uh, either chat with them and tell them they can log out or, you know, log in to talk to Miss So-and-so as they would send the child to the principal's office and let the principal or counselor, whoever the staff person is, kind of assess what is going on. 
um, so that that child doesn't feel a need to be targeted. Um, and it just creates um, a bad message or a relationship with that teacher and that child over something that honestly that child may not um, have any control over. And you'd be surprised some kids are very territorial mm -hmm. of their, I wouldn't say ill fit parent, uh, but the parent that they know is trying to do the best that they can or is not doing the best that they can, but they love them nonetheless. And so they're never going to place blame on that person for whatever reason, uh, because of, you know, coming from a trauma informed standpoint, just seeking to understand and getting that child some support um, so that they can dress the part um, and join their classroom as they would if they were in the normal setting. So I would definitely say yes. Teachers, please be mindful of how you talk to students. Um, yeah. Even if they're acting out, they're communicating um, in a way where something has occurred or something has not occurred the night before. They may have not got any sleep um, or they may have been up wondering if their parent is going to come home. Uh, they may not have been fed. Um, and so now is not the time to put them on the spot, um, even if they are, are the child that has been targeted as always being disruptive. Uh, they're disruptive for a reason. So it's just a matter of you isolating them and taking away their audience and getting to know what is the issue, um, what's happened to them and not what's wrong with them. That part. So that right there is the host. That's part five. So Tim adding part four, you adding part five to it. So it's not what you do, as you talked about, it's how you do things. So pull students to the side. And also uh, going back to what we talked about with, like, with the parents' parents, um, there's always that one teacher or there's even an administrator where you may have that close relationship with, let them know what's going on. So that way they can alert the right people because you'll be surprised. Um, uh, you'll be surprised at the supports that are in place to accommodate students to make sure that, you know what, that's an issue that you're having. Oh, we got something for you. We can help you out. So, you know, going back, hey, closed mouths don't get fed. So we're not saying, hey, you got to tell all your business. But we are in place to do different things for you. So let us know. Let that person that you trust and have a good relationship know so we can get it to the right people. Um, I will, one more thing. I'm sorry. I'm taking over. Yeah. But I will say this. I have several people every year who are who reach out asking, is there a family in need? Are there uniforms that I need to buy or is there money I can give? So um, please, parents, if you're listening, students, um, if you're listening, reach out. You can reach out to myself or anybody on this panel. Reach out to somebody who can get their hands on somebody who knows somebody. And I can assure you that every person who needs something, we will make sure that they have what they need. Trust me. You Now, you're right about that. You guys are absolutely right about that. And we'll take one last question, and then we're going to wrap up and give our concluding uh, piece of advice to our students and our parents. And Miss Arlethea Mackey, <clears throat> so she said, uh, what, are some what are some ideas for family and parent support that you all have that a school and their staff can provide? So once again, uh, we'll have Janae take this one. Um, what are some ideas for family and parent support that you all have? that you all have that a school and their staff can provide? So I'll name a couple things that we are doing. So one is we're having a parent orientation that's just about technology. Um, we, the last, like I've never used this platform before and the, the other collective uh, meeting had something that was in, uh, I can't remember the name of that one, but I was like, Keep I don't learning. know what this is. I need to log in or yeah, I was like, I don't know what this is. So I think there's like, you know, uh, James spoke earlier about a judgment free zone. Invite your parents to that. Let's get as basic as like, hey, this is how you get the hotspot on. This is how you get the wireless, um, you know, the, the password to pop up. So making sure that parents have an understanding of how the technology works is really something that you can provide and kind of ease minds. Um, secondly is providing those schedules, links, um, as the uh, student leader talked about. It's so important. Give that information to parents early so they can digest it and do what they need to do to have their students present if possible. And then um, I think that all schools should continue to provide counseling support, <clears throat> social worker referrals. There are a lot of great teletherapy organizations out there that your um, teammates can be trained in so that we do not say if a student has uh, separate, you know, additional needs. Okay, we'll see you after the pandemic is over. Um, everybody is in an emotionally heightened state right now. And so we need those supports more now than ever before. So 
continuation of those additional wraparound uh, services, making sure parents understand the technology, and then providing schedules That's and leads as early as possible. Woo. Uh, that, and that orientation piece, um, schools, if you're a school leader, which I know we got some school board members following our page and some teachers and there's some teachers on right now. If you haven't done so already, I think you hit the nail on the head, Janae, when you said even having an orientation where you are getting parents acclimated to as many uh, features of the technology, expectations, the kinks, what they can run into, the things that you guys talked about, strategies around like setting up your home in a conducive way to learning. Have an orientation where you go through all of these things. Show parents how to log in. Show the students how to log in. Talk to the students around ch charging up your laptop the night before and making sure that it's fully charged. Make sure that you have all these supplies and everything that you need, right? So having that space to do it on the front end, because I'm just going to be honest with you guys, like there's a lot of people out there who are very reactionary, right? You know, whether it's in education or whether it's in different fields, we don't react until after the fact. This is an opportunity for us to go ahead and put some things in place on the front end. We have a lot of time. Time right now was really not on our side, but it is in a way for some school districts. I don't know. Mom, we kind of the giddy pig right now. We're just going through. But those folks that's in SES, look, y'all talk with some folks who've already started. Y'all know y'all can hit me up and reach other folks who've started. But yeah, I'm telling y'all, use this time wisely. Don't sit on it because it's going to be August 31st before you know it. And with that being said, we're now going to come to uh, the point where we are going to give concluding remarks for tonight. Our student leader, she did get kicked off. Uh, she sent me a text. She said her computer died. So, you know, hey, virtual learning, all that good stuff. Um, but I'm so glad that she was able to come on and share just a perspective from the student, right? Because a lot of the times policies are being made, superintendents are making decisions, principals are making decisions, and we don't hear, we hear from everybody but the student. So I'm so glad that she was able to come on and share her thoughts. So uh, we'll start with Tim. So Tim, in our concluding remarks, what is one last piece of advice that you would give to uh, the students and the parents as they get ready to embark on virtual learning? Advice to students and parents. The, I think the, the biggest piece of advice that I would give is, um, it, it, it's kind of connected to the idea of giving grace, but this is more about giving grace to yourself and know it's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to feel anxiety. It's okay to feel completely lost. But what we want you to do is stay with us as we walk down this uh, path together. Stay with us on this journey so that together uh, we can come out on the other side. But in the meantime, all of your feelings, um, all, of, all of the emotions that go along with it is perfectly okay. Uh, I think you mentioned it earlier, James, or it may have been Janae, but like we, we as adults, we're, we're feeling the same thing. We have the same stressors, but stay with us on this journey. Allow yourself to feel what you need to feel so that you can process through it. But let's come out on the other side. Excellent. Stronger Thank together, you so much. Tar, what, what last piece of advice would you give to uh, students and parents as they get ready to embark on virtual learning for the first time? I always just tell students and parents to take this time to cultivate relationships. Um, the relationships that they establish um, is going to be crucial because the better your relationship that you have, the easier it is to ask for help. And so take this time to just reach out and build a support network and be a support. And I think uh, that will help you to, to as um Tim mentioned a few minutes ago, it will help you to understand and be okay with not having all the answers and not knowing something, but with the right support and relationship, everybody's in this thing together and it, and, and it takes the anxiety out of it. So, Excellent. And they say, say the best for last, mm -hmm. right? So um, Mr. Nate Douglas, what, what advice would you give to our students and parents? So mine's kind of connected to Tim. I think just stopping to take a deep breath and just finding the joy in all the craziness. Um, like the things that happened at the beginning of this call, um, the things we were talking about have happened 9,000 times. We've done, uh, we're doing virtual PD this summer and someone is always getting kicked out. Someone's mic is always off when they're trying to speak. Um, and so just helping your students to your kids to say like, hey, this might be rocky 
but it's okay. And we are all doing the very best that we possibly can. And just helping, like, you know, if you're, if you have a child who really likes to read or really likes to do math or likes to do some type of after school activity, connecting with those people in the school to see how we can, re how they can recreate those experiences in the virtual setting. Um, we are, we're purchasing a digital library so kids can still have access to thousands of texts. So whatever works for your kid, helping them to find the joy and just laugh um, with all of this newness that we are embracing. Now, you know, I wrote that down when you said digital library, my eyebrow went up. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, AR offers, offers a digital library add on. It's 12,000 titles. So push on your folks to to get that for your kids. Who is that again? AR, the AR. Renaissance Learning that owns AR. Yes. Yeah. That's excellent. See, I heard that. There's some teachers yep. out here. <laughs> gotta write it down. Ask somebody about it. Yeah. Well, we have come to uh, the end of our first part of our series, which is, of course, reimagining education, creating the village that our students and parents need during a pandemic. Um, Y'all, if this is something that is unprecedented, we've never experienced this before. But if you're a student or if you're a parent on here, just know, as the panelists talked about tonight, you are not in this alone. We are all in this together. This is not a parent issue to solve. This is not an issue for students to solve on their own. This is a community issue because the impacts and the ramifications that it will have will you know, be on everyone that is in this city. So it's gonna be up to us to come together, to give each other grace, to look for the problems inside of every opportunity and to continue to push forward because our kids are at the very forefront of all of this. And they're watching every single thing that we do um, and we have to model and, and set that example for them as we embark on this new journey. So as we get ready to end out, of course, I would be remiss if I did not give a shameless plug to the part two of our virtual uh, reimagined education series. So like I said, tonight we focused on students and parents. Mark your calendars for August 25th. That is going to be two weeks from today. It's on a Tuesday and we're going to be focusing on, yes, the teachers, the new uh, our veteran teachers, we're going to be talking about what we can do to create a village for our teachers, right? They need a lot of support. So our next series, part two, is going to focus on our wonderful teachers who are on the front lines and on the call of duty every single day. Once again, thank you all for joining us on tonight. And um, if you haven't already done so, like the Collective MEM on Facebook and our Instagram group and follow us as we continue to just bring more and more each and every week. Y'all have a great night and we'll see y'all in two weeks on the 25th for our part two of our series. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Hello, Memphis family. My name is Brittany Batson, and I'm a board member of the Collective Memphis chapter, which is the Alumni Association of Color for Teach for America. As we all know, several school districts throughout the country will return to school virtually as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. This has created an unprecedented layer of stress and uncertainty for all of our students, parents, and educators. The impact of this decision will have several ramifications. However, it is the responsibility of the entire community to come together to provide support, solutions, and hope as we all navigate the unknown. With service on our mind, the Collective Memphis has decided to step up and host a three-part virtual series entitled Reimagining Education, creating the village that our students, parents, teachers, and community need during a pandemic. Our primary aim is to provide a platform to educate, engage, and empower all of our stakeholders as we prepare for the challenges that come along with virtual learning. We'll kick off part one of our series on August the 11th, focusing on supporting our students and parents. Part two will be on August the 25th with the lens on supporting teachers. And our final installment on September the 15th, will explore how our community at large can support our schools. Each portion of this series will take place from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. on our Facebook Live. Inside every problem lies an opportunity and there is nothing we can't overcome if we all work together to find solutions. We look forward to your participation. For more information about our series, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Collective Mem. See you all soon.